and the impacts here and the for coastal resilience and the ocean economy. So quite an exciting lines of speakers. Um, for a reminder, ask questions, ask the tough ones. I think the panelists will like that, or maybe not, they will not like that. Um, the event is also recorded, so this will be available on our event page and to our panelists online, do drop in the questions. Our colleague Stephanie Chua will be collecting them and sending them over to us. So with no further ado, let's jump in. And I can figure it out now this time. To, yes, I did. I'm a technical guru. So today we are talking about sand. And maybe it's not a topic that comes up a lot, especially in terms of the UN Ocean Conference. But sand is key. It delivers key ecosystem services. It maintains biodiversity. It's a key ingredient in construction materials. And it's really embedded in our economies. So if you came here today, you probably drove on sand or you, you, you left slept in a house made of concrete. So you also slept on sand. Your computer or the phone you're using this morning is made of sand. It's really everywhere. And for the sake of this conversation, terminology is really a hotbed topic, but we will be using the term ocean and marine sand here to refer to sand, gravel, crushed rock, aggregates from the seabed and the coastal environment. So you will see quite a few terms floating around depending on the organization and the industry coming around. Um, just to set the topic, why are we talking it in terms of the UN Ocean Conference? Well, um, sand is the, one of the most mined uh, uh, minerals, and especially from the marine environment. It's extracted um, also from land quarries originally, a lot from riverbeds too, but to satisfy growing demand, it's increasingly dredged from the ocean. So this includes for land reclamation projects, beach nourishment, um, uh, coastal defense projects. And all our panelists today can be speaking to any of these aspects. So just a little quick background. M most of you have probably also heard from the media, diverse extraction practices, both from the riverine, the marine, the coastal environments, and with a varying degree of mechanization. Some is very artisanal, some is highly mechanized on a huge scale, capital intensive. And at across these scales, we're seeing impacts both on the people, but also on the environment. So but what we're increasingly realizing is that we're, we're increasingly understanding sand's role in the context of coastal resilience and how with all the extraction of sand from our coastal areas, well, these are left with lower natural sand reserves and protection. And that is actually diminishing our ability to protect our coastal zones and future-proof them against growing sea level rises and these challenges that are arising in the future. So, but what we're also realizing is that sand, when I try to think about this, it's really tough, I really struggle because sand is at the heart of sustainable development, but it's really not addressed in the current resource governance setup. And that when we try to think about sand, we'll have to think about infrastructure, coastal management, exclusive economic zones, marine protected areas, customary fishing and marine rights, a lot of stuff. And that is really not addressed in the current, in the current resource governance setup. It's really a mixy, patchy picture out there uh, where some of it addresses. There is really good guidance that could tell us how we should be thinking about it, but it's not addressed horizontally, both within national ministries um, and governments and vertically across these scales of jurisdictions and laws um, when we think about these things. Thank God there is, some, there is some good stuff that is coming out here and our speakers will also be able to speak to that and international progress is happening on the good side. Um, that is helping us think about where do we need to go when we want to govern these resources. And on the international scene, um, progress is also happening in both how we should frame, we should govern and extract these resources. So the IUCN called for the urgent global management of sand in 2021. And the two UNEA resolutions, United Environment Assembly in 2019, called for its integration into how we think about mineral resource governance, but also how we sustainably build our infrastructure. And this was also followed up with the latest United Environment Assembly in 2022. So it's definitely on the mind on the international scene um, in that sense. So enough about me uh, and enough about sand. I think we need to hear a bit from all the panelists that we have here today, because we will be having a discussion about both. So what are the impacts here when we think about sand, uh, both from the environmental, but also the social ones? And what are some of the 
on the less negative side, but what, what are some of the policy, the technical, um, the business solutions we can think about, or if we should be pushing towards, we should be thinking about and implementing when we want to sustainably and equitably manage these resources. And our panel today will be able to bring you forward examples across these different lines. So we'll be sharing work from the think tank world, from UNEP, and from the aggregate industry, as well as civil society representatives. And this includes SAN's role in the ocean economy with the Swedish think tank uh, Stockholm Resilience Center, some of the evidence-based decision-making we should be thinking about in land reclamation projects with the civil, civil society group Save the Maldives in the context of a low-lying island. We'll also be hearing from how we should be engaging with the financial institutions, thanks to UNEP FI here today. We'll also be hearing online from some of the good practices that the industry could be thinking about with the British Marine Agrarist Producers Association. And we'll be hearing about monitoring, why that matters, both from a top scale perspective using AI with the Great Geneva, and also from bottoms up community engagement, participatory engagement with the Filipino NGO, Cali Sican People's Network for the Environment. So I talked a lot, and now I'm gonna hand it over to our excellent line of speakers here today. So I'm going to ask, uh, uh, yes, you see their beautiful faces again, and I'm going to hand it over to Jean-Baptiste. The floor is yours. Let's turn to you if you want to give me a sense of the scale of the problem and where this heads us. And now the topic of technical. Thank you very much, Josephine. Thank you everyone for making the time to come today in person, but also to join us online. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, my name is Jean-Baptiste Jouffre. I'm a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Center. And I shall say at Stockholm University, because with my boss here that it's a Swedish think tank, I'm gonna be in trouble. So we're an interdisciplinary center at the University of Stockholm. <laughs> Um, and really happy to be talking about Sand. I was asked to set the stage maybe with some reflection on the broader context of sand in the ocean and specifically in what we often refer to as the Anthropocene Ocean. And the, the Anthropocene really describes a new epoch where humans have become a dominant force of planetary change. And that, of course, has consequences for unprecedented speed, scale, and connectivity across the world, not just the ecosystem, but also cultures, economies, societies. Perhaps one of the most iconic uh, illustration of the Anthropocene was the work by Will Stephan and colleagues on the Great Acceleration that shows a really exponential increase in a wide range of variables, uh, starting post-World War II in, in the mid 50s and really accelerating uh, over the past 70 years now both earth system trends, but also socioeconomic trends. If you look at it in the context of the ocean, um, it looks very similar and, and very much inspired by the great acceleration. This is what you could consider to be a blue acceleration, a new phase in humanity's relationship with the ocean that exhibits a phenomenal rate of change over the past 30 years. And it really is at the onset of the 21st century that you actually see that acceleration. If you just look at the past 20 years, those are the personal growth increase in those different use, uh, uh, ocean uses. So we are having a 500 fold increase in offshore wind farm capacity. We have 1.4 million kilometer of submarine cables that are going under the sea and providing 99% of all international telecommunication. So for those of you who are online, this communication is going undersea as we speak. Uh, marine aquaculture, fastest food production sector in the world, and so on. This, what you're seeing here, that rapid acceleration is really the new ocean reality. And that is what you can refer to as the Anthropocene Ocean. Now, you may ask, what about sand? Well, sand is fundamental to those trends, not just the economic uses, but certainly the ecosystem. I think Josephine introduced it. Sand is everywhere. It is the planet most mined mineral today. Um, it's rapidly increasing, driven by urbanization, industrialization. You find it in all parts of society. In a way, it really is uh, the modern, uh, the building blocks of modern society. But I can't show you a curve similar to the ones I showed before because we don't have the data. 
and certainly not over time. Even getting a current snapshot is really hard. And I think this is something that uh, panelists after me will, will get more into detail. Now, when we talk about ocean sand specifically, there are two sides of the same con. One is the notion of sand in the ocean ecosystem. And that speaks to the value of sand um, as a source of life, as a source of biodiversity, as a critical habitat for coastal biodiversity, essential also for coastal dynamics, acting both as a buffer, but also a barrier between the ocean and land. A lot of organisms, a lot of ecosystem services in the coastal zone and offshore depend on a healthy sand habitat. But there is also sand in the ocean economy. And of course, they are interconnected. But here is recognizing that sand is everywhere in most of the sectors that are making the ocean economy. The, 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 maybe the most straightforward one is, of course, the dredging industry. But the dredging industry is a multifaceted industry. It's ju not just the extraction of the resources to use it, but it's also the displacement of the resource. So think of land reclamation. Think of each replenishment. Think of shipping and deepening harbors or deepening channels um, for offshore wind farms. Um, so it is really at the heart of, of, of this um, ocean economy. But the economy itself is embedded into a broader context. So this is a nice visualization of the different SDGs where you have some form of hierarchy showing that a healthy economy requires a healthy society. It seems like our online participants. I hate to do that. <laughs> it wasn't showing. Sure. Is it showing? Yep. Yeah. Okay. It's yours. From there, from here. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I feel bad for the ones online who have been following without seeing anything. They couldn't see the slide. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, I'm afraid I'm going to have to keep, uh, keep starting from here. And uh, with sincere apologies for those of you who were following online not to have been able to see the, the first few slides. Hopefully, I described them and, and did them justice. Here, I was mentioning the embeddedness of, of the economy within the society, within the biosphere, realizing the importance of, of having a healthy biosphere to have a healthy economy. Why I mentioned that is because sand extraction has a lot of, of multiple impacts. It has a whole diversity of impacts. And, and the point here is not to go one by one through all of them. Here are just a few of them listed, but you will see that it covers a range of, of loss of ecosystem. It, it can be the loss of entire ecosystem. Think of, of seagrass beds or coral reefs being pounded for land reclamation all the way to a decline in biodiversity, species abundance, a physical modification of the seabed topography, which can alter currents and, and sediment flows to, to, the, to the shoreline, um, as well as social and livelihood impacts. And, and one may be uh, often underlooked, and, and I'm glad we have speakers with us today that can speak on that point, is the impact of sand mining on coastal communities and often the most vulnerable one. There's also another dimension is who is mining the sand and who's dredging it. And here there's something really interesting that is not specific uh, to sand. You find it in other sectors, not least fisheries, but it's very obvious in the context of sand mining. On one hand, you're gonna have a highly consolidated dredging industry with a very few large companies operating a fleet across the world and with high scale infrastructure. But on the other hand, you also have small scale extraction, often unregulated, sometimes undocumented and even illegal in some places and much harder to keep track of than the dredging fleet. And that speaks to the notion of equity, not just when who is extracting the sand, but also who is impacted by sand. And, and I will conclude on that final notion and maybe as a segue for our next uh, panelist to consider the equity dimension of sand. Broadly, in the ocean economy, there are serious concerns about systemic inequity. This is not specific to sand. You find it in multiple sectors of the so-called blue economy. But to be truly blue, really, 
an ec a ocean economy should, pro and I'm going to cite here the high-level panel uh, report, the ocean panel report on ocean equity, saying that a blue economy should protect human rights, improve human well-being, stimulate inclusion and gender equity, and prioritize recognition, <laughs> diversity, and equal access to resources. This is something that is highly relevant in the context of sun mining and that I, I look forward to engaging the conversation on. This is my final slide to illustrate that point and say that accelerating sun stewardship, and I think we can get back to, to what that would mean, really requires a collective and collaborative effort across the entire value chain. So it's not just the dredging industry, it's not just policy uh, makers, it's not just civil societies, but it's interaction and collective efforts across all those segments of the society. And I'm really glad to say that most of those are today represented with us on the panel, whether in person or online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste. I'm going to, after Jean-Baptiste is here, bringing in the equity dimension, I'm going to have to break both the online sharing here, and we're going to hand it over to a civil society campaigner, which is actually looking at these impacts of equity dredging, but for whom? And especially in the context of a low-lying island. So Humai, I'm going to give the floor to you. I'm just going to stop screen sharing. Up. Humai, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the, this opportunity to tell some sand stories from the Maldives. Uh, if I may share my screen, please. Um, Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are. OK. Um, let me try and load my slideshow. OK. You're able to see that, right? Yes. Uh, let me just begin with a very quick introduction. I know time is of the essence. Uh, uh, my name is Hume, and I represent uh, a citizen movement called the Save Maldives Campaign. Uh, from the Maldives, uh, we came together to protest uh, the unsustainable destruction of uh, uh, ecosystems uh, in the Maldives in, back in 2017. So we continue to advocate to protect ecosystems. That is where we're coming from. So I, I guess uh, we will be rather biased <laughs> in uh, our angle, uh, but uh, we feel that this is extremely important. Uh, land reclamation in the Maldives uh, is uh, primarily done in very sustainable ways and the impacts of sand and mismanagement are really considerable. So um, let me begin uh, by saying that the government of Maldives recognizes uh, that uh, um, coastal modification is a threat, uh, which includes uh, uh, sand mining, cutting channels, reclamation and harbor development. All these are uh, pose significant threats to the Maldives, which is a, uh, which has a very uh, what we call a fragile ecosystem, but actually very resilient ecosystem uh, of uh, reefs, lagoons, and uh, the surrounding uh, ocean and coastal uh, shores. Um, reclamation in the Maldives uh, has been um, uh, has been accelerating in the last ten years or so. Um, according to the uh, State of the Environment Report uh, of 2016, which is the latest one we have available, 1,300 hectares of reef or lagoon area has been reclaimed from some 98 inhabited islands across the country. Now, the same report also tells us, given the breakdown of the amounts of sand use, that uh, 1,638 hectares has been reclaimed in 24 islands. So now this raises the question of how reliable is the data? Is it 1,300 hectares in 98 islands or 1,600 hectares in 24 islands? We are not sure. I will run you through uh, very quickly the imagery this creates for us uh, in the Maldives. I think uh, Maldives uh, needs to be seen visually and no amount of words can explain this. Uh, without some visuals. So I will, I will share some examples of what we're talking about here. This is uh, Laviani Atoll in the Maldives. We have about 26 natural atolls um, and Hinnavar Island is in Laviani Atoll. This is what the island looked like in 2005. As you can see, the island does not look natural even then. In 2010, you can see the modifications happening around the island. In 2020, 
we find that uh, this uh, reclamation remains dormant and unused. And this is what the island looks like in 2021. Now, the rationale for uh, this reclamation was housing, among other things. But we find that this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, does not really work. Uh, the Hinnavaru is not an isolated case. The narrative of land reclamation for housing is like an illusion. In many communities, we have land reclaimed, but laying dormant and unused for any reason, not just housing. Now, this is Hadal Atoll Kurdufushi Island. This is um, one of the reasons the Save Maldives campaign came in, uh, was uh, activated. Uh, uh, this, this is one of the largest uh, um, mangrove systems and wetland systems in the country. And uh, in 2017, the government decided to put an airport on top of the wetland. And this is what it looks like now uh, afterwards. And we have no idea how much sand was used in this project also. Um, now the, the wetland has been compromised and the island uh, suffers from severe flooding uh, on a regular basis. So uh, even now the uh, airport is uh, uh, having to be budgeted to be protected yet again following this destruction. Um, this is Haalif Atoll uh, in, and I'd like to uh, raise, uh, bring you the story of Horofushi Airport. Uh, on, in July 2016, as you can see, there is no airport. And in 2019, an airport was uh, planned. And uh, in 2021, we have here an airport uh, put in a very critical area uh, with severe uh, impacts on the surrounding ecosystem and marine uh, life. In May 2021, the airport was completely inundated uh, uh, due to a storm surge. And uh, now the government is talking about removing the link road from the island to the airport to stop the erosion of the island. So this is another serious example of mismanagement and uh, maladaptation uh, happening in the Maldives. This is a uh, Shaviani Atoll. Uh, I, I want to mention Komando Island. This is Komando Island in 2006. As you can see, it's not a natural island. There's a much more natural island next to it. In 2014, this is what it looked like. In 2019, this is what it looks like. And in 2022, the government has proposed to reclaim the next door island and link the two islands, even when the government knows that the revetments protecting Komando Island at the moment are overtopping and the land cannot be used. So this sand remains dormant and unused also. This is in Kafo Atoll, which is uh, Male Atoll. Male is the capital of the Maldives. This is an, uh, a reef and lagoon. Uh, this is the picture of it in 2016, in 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2022. 10 artificial resorts have been created on this reef we don't know the damage. The damage is never studied in these initiatives. How much sand? We don't know. This is Kafa Atoll again. Gulifalu Reef and Lagoon is the uh, uh, it is a site of a, of a conflict, an environmental conflict right now. The Gulifalu Port Development Reclamation Project is happening, and it's supposed to be using 20 million cubic meters of marine sand dredged from an area of about 14 square kilometers in Male Atoll. Um, the, this, this particular reclamation work is going to be one of the deepest reclamations uh, ever attempted in the Maldives at 22 meters depth. Uh, this, this project will destroy or completely destroy a marine protected area and also affect uh, uh, several diving sites, about 30 odd diving sites in the vicinity and many other resorts nearby as well, uh, compromising their house reefs. Now, right now, the project website tells us they're using 24.5 million cubic centimeters of sand. So I'm not sure where the 4.5 million extra sand has come from, certainly not from an EIA. This is what the site looks like in 2020. Uh, and this is what it looks like in 2022. So this is what the government envisages the site to look like with the port development project. 
Gulifal sand survey was done by the contractor. According to the Minister for Planning, this, the results of this survey are not available to the Maldives Parliament or himself, in fact, because the results are the intellectual property of the contractor. Let me just very quickly go through Addu Atoll. Addu Atoll is a UNESCO biosphere reserve, which is at risk at the moment. The Addu reclamation project is going to use all, almost all the sand, uh, virtually all the sand, and then, and then some from the lagoon, from the Atoll lagoon. Seven million cubic meters of sand is uh, supposed to be dredged from an area, 42% of the Atoll's lagoon. So, um, you know, this means uh, to do this pro project, they will need to borrow more sand from another atoll, which will impact that atoll. This project also undermines many uh, marine protected areas. Addu reclamation is primarily being done again with the housing story, as well as to create five artificial islands to make tourist resorts. This is what it looks like. Um, you know, as you can see, there are several marine protected areas. The buffer zones are just created with little rings around it. But of course, we know that the entire atoll lagoon will be compromised as a result of this project. There is no way around this. So the Addu Biosphere Reserve is under threat. Um, the whole of it is under threat with many areas, both marine and also into the uh, wetland and mangrove areas uh, are at risk. Uh, there is a, a, one of the best dive sites in the country, which is a shipwreck, is, which was uh, 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 declared a marine protected area in 2018 is at risk. Uh, a very significant uh, manta gathering point is at risk. And of course, uh, um, 21 hectares of coral reef and 120 hectares of seagrass beds are expected to be eliminated as part of this project. I thank you. I hope that provides some insight into what's happening in the Maldives and how sand is being used in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Humay, for joining us online. And I think I'm not the only one who is actually really flabbergasted by the scale of, of what we're watching here. This watching you and bringing up the fleshing out some of these different issues here, environmental governance in the case of land reclamation, there's many. And we will have, I think, a chance to discuss these uh, among EIAs, conflict of interest, um, et cetera, et cetera, in the Q&A. But this makes me think perhaps of who is actually, who should we be bringing to the table? Who should be underpinning? Um, these type of activities and who should we be discussing with this, who are paying for these activities. And uh, on this hotbed topic, I'm going to hand it over to Dennis um, for more. Okay, just get it. I'll just, if Humay, you would uh, stop sharing, then I will share again. Else maybe I can just do it. See. I apologize. Um trying to ah yes is that right there you go thank you thank you and and thanks for the uh for the striking images to the previous speaker that was um incredible actually and um yeah um honored to speak after after these these two great presentations uh, my Name is Dennis Fritsch, and I lead the Sustainable Blue Economy Workstream at UNEPFI. For those of you who don't know us, we are a partnership between the UN Environment Program and the global financial sector. So we work with more than 450 banks, insurers, and investors globally to, on the sustainable finance agenda. And relevant to, to today's topic and the topic of the, the conference, of course, we also convene a Kind of peer learning network on blue finance, really looking to mainstream sustainable finance practices across the um, global financial industry. And you might ask why we're doing this. Um, public and finance and private financial institutions obviously provide uh, the, the the means and the capital to power ocean link sectors, and including dredging. And that means that. Um, Banks, insurers, and investors have significant leverage to transform these sectors at pace. And uh, you all know that business as usual um, in the ocean space is, is really not an option anymore. So we are trying to work with these financial institutions to, um, to influence change 
in these industries. Um, and so what can financial institutions do today to align their activities with SDG 14 Life Below Water? And especially on this topic of dredging and, and sand extraction, I, I'm going to speak a bit first about our more general work um, and, and maybe give some quite practical points of, of what can be done now. If you're working for a financial institution, a bank, insurer, investor, um, there are resources out there that you can use. First, um, you can join our Blue Finance Network. Um, we um, convene almost 80 financial institutions and other expert organizations around the globe on the sustainable blue economy finance principles. Um, these are the world's gold standard to finance a sustainable ocean future. And they were endorsed by the Portuguese government. And I'm very happy to see many partners and even a few signatories to these principles around the conference this week. And um, as I said, we, we work a lot around um, education awareness raising, of course, around this topic of the sustainable blue economy, which is very, uh, very new for most financial institutions, as you might expect. Um, but also we work on producing knowledge resources and um, a lot of these resources now exist, I'm happy to say, um, building on the momentum of these principles that I mentioned, we have developed practical blue finance guidance, supporting financial institutions across a wide range of ocean link sectors, you can see them here on the screen actually, and these specifically make science based recommendations on how to deal with certain activities across sectors like offshore renewable, seafood, um, tourism, or uh, coastal infrastructure, for example. And, and you know, feel free to check that out. But today we, we want to talk about a different topic. Um, we recently published a briefing paper on dredging and marine aggregate extraction, including sand, which takes a similar approach to these guidance documents in, in that it uh, looks at the environmental and social impacts of, of this activity and then gives recommendations to financial institutions of how, um, how these impacts uh, sit with them in a, in a, from a risk perspective and how they can act in support of more responsible practices. Um, this, this has been developed with the input from over 70 experts from the financial, scientific and industry sides, including our co-hosts from Crit Geneva and, and Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, and, and dredging is, is inherently tricky for a sustainable blue economy because um, it is obviously inherently harmful to the marine environment. And again, we've seen some quite striking images just now uh, on uh, how this looks on the ground if done wrong. Um, but it also is actually contributing to um, some of these sectors that are part of the sustainable blue economy, namely to, um, um, shipping port ports and uh, marine renewables as well. So for some of the uh, sectors that that we actually um, want to want to encourage to grow over the over the coming years to to enable a, a sustainable use of ocean resources and and also to tackle the, the climate crisis of course we will likely need dredging um, and so that leaves us in a position where the dredging activity itself is harmful but um, we we can't really get around it um, and due to the nature of dredging activities often being part of broader infrastructure on construction projects, financial institutions may not necessarily be aware that uh, dredging is part of their project that they're involved in um, and that this is in their, in their value chains effectively. Um, and that obviously leaves them exposed to risks. I've... I've um, I've put some on the screen here. This is by by all means not, not all of the risks, um, but of course you know there are reputational regulatory issues um, that that um, that financial institutions are can be exposed to if they're not aware of of dredging being in the the value chains. And um, so, I would say the first recommendation from our end is to any financial institution listening in, you know, know your value chain uh, to minimize risks here because. Um, you know, there, there can be risks to, to other sectors, as, as Jean-Baptiste mentioned, um, to tourism, as we saw very strikingly here, um, but also, you know, other coastal infrastructure projects or fisheries. And of course, there's always an impact, an impact, as has been said, on the marine environment and on coastal communities too. And there have been some controversies around sand extraction with uh, linked with human rights violations as well. Um, but there are options to... Uh, support a transition to more responsible practices and these take two shapes um, and um, 
I'm going to share in a second a QR code so you can actually look at this this uh, this report um, yourself. It, it's available for free on our website, of course, and um, it, it essentially these these approaches take take two um, two approaches. One is to exclude the worst practices. Um, I've listed a couple of examples here on the slide. Um, one clear one one red flag that that shouldn't be fine is dredging in protected areas we've just seen that now is it, that's a it should be relatively clear i hope um, that that shouldn't be done but also you know activities resulting in a loss of access by by uh, indigenous communities or local communities to natural resources um, that, that would be another example of of a red flag of th things that should be excluded from financing um, and on the other end of the spectrum there are as i said opportunities to 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 do things better um, around following best practice, um, of course, multi-use marine spatial planning is, is, a, is a great way of making sure that um, all stakeholders' voices are heard and uh, in the development of a project. So I would certainly encourage financial institutions to go down that route, uh, but also, of course, looking for alternative materials wherever uh, possible, where, where, that's not, uh, where that's not an option to make sure that the material extracted and Crucially, also transported is using responsible sourcing principles that also exist out there. So we do um, in the, in our document we do name further examples, further exclusions, further best practices, and also um, provide explanations for why we recommend to exclude some of the activities and how financial institutions can actually verify this information about a specific activity and wh whether that's the case or not within their specific projects. And we also highlight further resources to use on a technical side. So please do check that out. Here's the QR code. I hope this works. Um, if it doesn't, let me know. I'm happy to share the link. Uh, we really want this to be a quite practical resource and, and useful for financial institutions in the first instance. And I can only recommend that you, you have a read through. As I said, um, this report and our other guidance documents um, can be found for free on our website. So, so do check that out. And uh, I want to finish by highlighting that financial institutions can really act as enablers of change here. They have a lot of expertise in underst and understanding of, of uh, risk and expertise in finding opportunities. So they really can, can um, be a force for good um, if, if they know what they have to do. And I think that's what we're, what we're trying to do at UNIBFI. Uh, SDG 14 really is not only an environmental challenge or target, it really also poses quite a big economic opportunity. And by building sustainable blue finance principles into decision-making processes and by speaking with clients on these topics, financial institutions have a unique opportunity to, as I said earlier, to, to steer ocean sectors uh, toward a sustainable future. So um, I hope that that ends on a, on a rather positive note uh, with, and, and doesn't spread too much doom and gloom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. I know I handed you the hot mic um, right there. <laughs> Thank you so much for introducing perhaps some of the options, and I'm sure there will be opportunities after that to flesh out some of the many opportunities. I advise everyone to have a look through um, the report. The links to all of the great work of our panelists is also being dropped in the chat for our online panelists and will be available for the on-site ones after that. With no further ado, I think we will hand over to Mark Russell, who will be online, who I think it brings also the, in the idea here that we need partnerships for this to work for all these important men, all these important points that Dennis was bringing up. We need partnerships. We need to work across the sectors in move, in being a force for good, as he said. So with no further ado, we'll hand it over to Mark Russell from the British Marine Aggregates Producers Association that can speak to perhaps some of the voluntary and the good practices that the industry is thinking about, they should be pushing towards and they should be implementing in the UK industry context. Over to you, Mark. Lovely. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, da, da. Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, let me get that. The floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you ever so much, Josephine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Sorry I'm not able to join you um, this morning. A uh, bit of introduction. My name is Mark Russell. Uh, I lead on planning and mineral resources in uh, a national trade association called the Mineral Products Association. 
But as part of that role, I'm also director of the British Marine Aggregate Producers Association, or BMAP of short, which is the representative trade organisation for the British Marine Aggregate industry. Um, and what I'd like to do this morning in the short five minutes that I've got is just give you a brief overview of the marine aggregate industry in the UK, um, how it's regulated, and the role that the sector itself plays in helping to shape sustainable practices. Um, history is quite important here because the extraction of marine sand and gravel in our country can be traced back to at least the 17th century with material removed from sandbanks at low water to provide ballast for sailing ships. And dredging for sand and gravel to support local construction activity actually began in the late 19th century. But the roots of the modern industry really began in the 1950s. And since this time, over 900 million tonnes of marine sand and gravel has been removed from licensed areas around the coast of, of England and Wales. I think importantly, extraction can only take place within defined license areas, which you can see on, on the slides. Uh, and the regional distribution of these very much reflects the discrete geological deposits that contain commercially viable sand and gravel, predominantly fossil or relict fluvioglacial deposits. And today, the British industry contributes around 8% of all the primary aggregates. So that's material that's been quarried or dredged for first use that's used in construction. But the regional contribution is far more significant. One third of all the construction material used in London and the southeast of England is from marine sources. And for the UK as a whole, one third of all construction activity takes place within that region. So the industry genuinely, genuinely does act as a kind of foundation to wider economic activity, as some of the earlier speakers referred to. But marine sand and gravel is increasingly being used to protect vulnerable coastlines through beach nourishment. And the UK industry also exports material to mainline, uh, mainland Europe for use in uh, construction. So over the last 30 years or so, um, marine policy and regulation has evolved to support sustainable practices for marine sand and gravel extraction that not only recognise the needs of society and, and the wider economy, but also the environmental consequences that are associated with meeting these needs. Today, we have national planning policy that acknowledges the essential role of all primary materials, which include marine source, in supporting construction and wider economic activity, alongside the need to maximise the use of recycled and secondary materials as part of the wider circular economy. These sources already contribute over 60 million tonnes of the 230 million tonnes of construction material that's consumed each year. And that contrasts the 20 million tonnes of marine material that's, that's currently done. We also have a marine UK, uh, a UK marine policy statement rather, that recognises the important contribution that marine aggregate resources make, while at the same time making it clear that extraction should only occur where it is considered environmentally acceptable to do so. And we have a network of, of, of marine plans that have developed over the last decade which have established policies to safeguard and protect finite and spatially discrete marine aggregate resources from being compromised by other forms of development. The marine environment's getting incredibly busy at the moment. The earlier speakers spoke about um, the expansion of offshore renewable energy, cables, et cetera. Um, so it's really important that, that marine aggregates have a role and a place. But the other thing that marine planning clearly does is it, it allows clear identification of areas of environmental sensitivity that should be avoided. And underpinning all of this is the marine licensing regime, which requires all dredging applications to be subject to a rigorous EIA process to assess the potential impacts. And licenses are only going to be issued if the national regulator considers the environmental consequences to be acceptable. And each license has specific conditions to manage, mitigate and monitor the impacts that are anticipated which are reviewed throughout the lifetime that the dredging operations take place. And this includes the use of black box electronic monitoring system to remotely track dredging activity. And there's an example of that on this particular slide. Bear with me, I'm just trying to, there we are. 
so this is my last slide, and it kind of pulls together this partnership approach that um, uh, Josephine was referring to. Because in parallel to the development of policy and regulation, the marine aggregate industry itself has played a really important role in proactively developing evidence-led guidance and good practice, working in close partnership with regulators, advisors, and other stakeholders. Alongside guidance that addresses issues such as EIA and regional cumulative assessments, coastal impacts, fisheries liaison, navigation risk, benthic monitoring, and marine archaeology. Reports and publications that the industry has produced have increased the transparency and awareness of the sector's activities offshore to ensure that even though they may be out of sight, they certainly aren't out of mind. By taking responsibility for delivering outcomes and solutions, industry-led good practice guidance has increased certainty and reduced risk for developers, regulators, and their advisors, and ultimately provided greater long-term confidence to all of the parties that are involved in the sustainable management of marine sand gravel extraction. And I think importantly for the discussion that we're having in this session, while these solutions may be specific to the UK industry, the kind of issues that they're addressing are likely to be similar wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I really like how you also finished on there and saying, yes, these are UK specific examples, but there are lessons to be learned across, um, across countries, across sectors um, from these examples here. Thank you, Mark. But no further ado, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Arnaud here in the room with us, who will be speaking to another side of this work, which is on the importance of monitoring, of understanding the data. I think it came up quite a few times uh, for our conversations, like, do we know how much we have in terms of resources? We need information, we need data in moving forward. Over to you. Let me just share. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Josephine, for giving me the floor. I hope everyone can hear me. I'll try to speak in the microphone. So um, before I, I talk about the risks and opportunities and the data, I, I, I thought to quickly touch, uh, to quickly start. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I have a technical issue because my text is not showing up. But no problem, I can do it without text too. Yeah. I'll do it like this. So we will do it without text, but before I, um, I dive into the risks and opportunities, I, I first want to underline um, the purpose of why we extract sand from the marine environment. And I want to indicate that the dredging industry, indeed, although dredging practices are harmful, the dredging industry is an essential industry in the sense that we need the dredging industry to shore up our coastlines. Uh, they provide us with the marine infrastructure we need. They provide the energy infrastructure we need with, with windmills. They also, as, as Mark indicated, extract sand and aggregates in those uh, locations where it isn't available on land. And most of our beaches, for example, in Europe, are nourished every year again. So without the dredging industry, the tourist industry would, would suffer. Um, tremendously. But um, I'll go to the next slide. Yes. But the, um, the, the, the way we extract sand is, is not done uh, at the same standard across the world. And um, very often, we do not know whether we extract sand at a higher rate than it is being replenished. It is therefore often, it comes often as a surprise to local authorities when they run out of sand. 
in their near in their near shores. Um, and therefore, UNEP Grid Geneva launched in April a report to which Josephine already refer, uh, referred, which is 10 strategic um, recommendations to avert a crisis. And in this report, we call for an international standard on marine sand extraction. We call to ban sand extraction from the beach system. Um, we call for transparent and policy-driven uh, decision-making, well, data-driven decision-making, and to exchange best standards, and uh, best standards and practices. And in order to support uh, data-driven decision-making, we partnered with Global Fishing Watch the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Google um, to create a platform. And without further ado, I'm going to play the promotion video that uh, we created for this. Uh, Thank you. I, I all I hope you can you speak now? I hope you all enjoyed the introduction, uh, the, 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 the sneak peek to uh, the, the global uh, Sandwatch platform we are creating. And the idea of this platform is actually giving developing countries that currently do not have the ability to monitor their exclusive economical zone, the tools to do that. Actually to provide the data to those who need it. And this is in order to prevent that harmful practices um, go unnoticed. And we actually hope with this platform also to reach out to the judging industry, to marine foundations who are active in this field, uh, to, to come and join us and to support us with this platform. Um, and with this platform, with, with creating transparency and with the creation of an international uh, marine sand extraction standards, we hope we can improve the practices around the world. Thank you. Thank you for this great for example of top-down monitoring of sand resources here of sand reserves. As our last but not least speaker here on today's panel, we'll hear from another approach to monitoring how much sand we have and what sand we do and where it's located. 
and the impact that this has. We'll be hearing to, um, handing over the floor, thank you, to Leon, who's joining us from the, the Philippines. We'll be speaking to Bottoms Up Monitoring here for community engagement. Over to you, Leon. Thank you, Josephine, and uh, warm greetings to everyone here in the UN Oceans Conference. I'm here representing a movement of Filipino coastal communities and a broader civil society network working on the integrity of coastal habitats and ecosystems, specifically across Manila Bay in the Philippines. Manila Bay is a nationally important marine body that is the country's fourth most productive fishing ground. It is a habitat to 146 fish species, 200 species of shellfish, and 15 species of mangroves. It is host to various Ramsar wetlands of international importance uh, and important bird areas as well. And it is linked to the world's uh, center of the center of marine biodiversity. It is also a cultural heritage site with its naval battle histories and famous sunset view. Manila Bay is uh, unfortunately beset with a plethora of ecological threats, but I would zoom into the problem of land reclamation activities across the bay. There are at least 31,000 hectares of the bay's foreshore areas, basically where all its biodiversity corridors are located, that are set to be cleared, dumped, and filled with topsoil. One of the biggest some examples of our reclamation projects in the bay is the 2,500 hectare New Manila International Airport, or the Aero City for short. The Aero City, despite being touted by its proponents as a world-class city of the future that in fact supposedly benefits from the world-class expertise of Dutch Delta planners, was and continues to be replete with various anomalies and abuses even before the project uh, got or secured its various permits and clearances. But I would like to focus, uh, instead of the doom and gloom, I would like to focus on sharing how we ocean and environmental defenders responded to this problem by demonstrating how uh, due diligence can really be done in Manila Bay where no one is truly left behind. So in 2018, we began with a rapid human rights and gender risk and impact assessment where we worked with fisher folk and other coastal communities across three provinces and two cities surrounding Manila Bay to look into the compliance of various reclamation projects with existing guidelines such as the OECD guidelines and the UN Business and Human Rights Principles. So through a combination of literature reviews, on-site workshops with fisher folks and other coastal communities and extensive documentation, we found out that none of the reclamation projects in these uh, areas, including the Aero City, were in compliance with what are supposed to be, you know, minimum international standards for business practices. So working with field scientists and community development practitioners from the University of the Philippines, we expanded on this initial impact assessment with what we would eventually coin as counter environmental impact assessments or counter EIAs. Essentially, this is an investigative research process that shadowed the formal EIA process of the proponent and the uh, government regulatory agency, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DENR. The counter EIA organized women and men of the fisher folk communities to become citizen scientists who analyzed the potential socioeconomic and geophysical impacts of the Aero City to their housing and livelihood. So we, we saw how over a period of two years, how community members cooperated with our volunteer scientists to compute their family income and expenses to come up with an economic valuation of their collective livelihood in the community, uh, to scope their villages for species of fish, shellfish, aquatic plants, and waterfowl, and to trace geohazard maps to understand the flooding and other hazards that would potentially be exacerbated once the reclamation activity started in their villages. We have been building on the findings of the counter EIA since last year to help local communities craft an alternative plan of governing Manila-based resource uh, and landscapes and seascapes. We have been facilitating visioning and planning workshops with various fisher folk communities using the counter EIA's baseline data and have been developing 
alternative proposals for securing the common fishing grounds, ensuring housing and sustainable livelihoods, restricting further destructive reclamation activities that are in conflict with the existing mangrove and fisheries expanses, and compelling the immediate rehabilitation and compensation for the villagers' properties, livelihoods, and the seabeds and other ecosystems that have already been affected by ongoing dredging activities that are not guided by the, by the insights and by the data uh, that can be, uh, uh, can be taken from the counter EIAs. So this is a continuing process that has actually found support from local village and municipal governments with the local chief executives recognizing that the, 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 uh, the points raised by the counter EIA and by the people's planning processes are legitimate and well-founded concerns raised by their local fisher folk and other coastal constituencies. It is a process that demonstrates that uh, what you can achieve if right at the onset, the notion of coastal development subscribes to an honest to goodness environmental and human rights due diligence. So uh, looking forward to discussing this further in our uh, open forum. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Leon. And uh, I think you close our panel on a positive note, reminding of the importance here of community-led engagement of institutionalizing a process of communities' involvement in land reclamation projects. And in this specific case, in the context of the Philippines, where a land reclamation project is taking place for the construction of a second airport outside um, and next to Manila. And with this, no further ado, we are going to move over to a Q&A. We're a bit tight of times, so we're a bit tight on time. So we will also be a bit selective in the questions. And both for our online and our on-site participants, I'm guessing there's quite a few questions coming in. I know Stephanie's been collecting quite a few online. First, I'm gonna turn over to our participants in the room. If there is any question, um, I invite you to ask our panelists if you can, um, if you can introduce your same, your name and affiliation. Yeah, my name is Antonio Akwan, and I'm from uh, an African Vision for the Environment, Lagos, Nigeria. So it's a great pleasure to be here. I mean, the issue of when I saw the side event on sun uh, um, sustainability, I was really marveled, you know, because it's something that has not been uh, highlighted, you know. So my my questions to comment is, what are the support mechanisms, you know, because really there's really need for more advocacy and awareness about these issues, you know? So how, what are the support mechanisms for NGOs, particularly to be able to take this advocacy and uh, awareness activities um, around the world, particularly in Africa? Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps I'm thinking of giving, I think Humai would be really interested in having also this question. Humai, can you, could you, do you hear the question online? Um, what role should we be playing here in not only raising more awareness of these types of issues here that are happening and the impacts that it's having on the ground and what type of stakeholders we need to bring into uh, this. If Humayu, you can hear me. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, actually, um, in the Maldives too, we do really struggle to raise these issues because uh, there is very limited awareness of uh, the climate emergency. Maldives is actually, uh, uh, you know, very aware of the climate uh, crisis, and uh, our parliament has declared a climate emergency. But what that means in practice, what that means to all of us, is not really very clear. So I think um, we have a huge challenge uh, on awareness raising, and as advocates. Uh, to get the message across about the potential for uh, damage. And of course, we know uh, from the examples of damage uh, already sustained across the country that uh, something has to be done about this. But um, I think it's very difficult to compare. Uh, you know, Maldives is very sparsely populated communities, about 1,000, 2,000 people in our islands, uh, mo most of the communities are very small and are not in a position to resist uh, in ways that maybe uh, larger populations can. And listening to Leon, 
I think uh, I, 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 I feel that there is a huge difference. I mean, the processes that you have used are, are exceptional, uh, but um, we, our capacity to mobilize in that way is very limited because we are very dispersed. So it's very location specific, you know, our islands are very far apart. Uh, it is very costly. Transport is very costly here. And uh, it's not possible to move around. Uh, but of course, now we have uh, virtual uh, connectivity and, and that is a big help. So it is uh, an, an improvement. So I think uh, using technology and uh, connecting and, and, and mobilizing that way is perhaps our best opportunity as we are doing right now, I guess. Uh, yeah, I hope that provides some uh, uh, comment on to that question. Thank you. And I, I, I think I will quickly add to that. Um, often, sand, the impacts of sand extraction occur over time. And when you extract, let's say, a couple of a million cubic meters of sand, the beach, the beach, which is perhaps a couple of hundred meters or a kilometer further, will not disappear overnight. And what, what we think, what we believe at UNEP Geneva is, is fundamental to support NGOs is, is to provide that data, to provide the, the data to, for you to be able to link that to impact. Because it's often very difficult for on-land actors to point at what has been done at sea. It's under the water surface. So I think to add to my colleague. Thank you, Arno. And we have another question here in the room. Thank you so much. And thank you, all five of you were amazing presenters. And I, I was really struck by Humai's presentation. Uh, the visuals are just shocking, and especially the example of the UNESCO biosphere reserve being dredged. It's about your presentation, Humai, but maybe it's a question for Mark and Dennis. I look at this and it, it is a shocking example for the industry, but I understand that the company behind this as well as the financers behind this are known. And what can you do with that information to really use this to raise awareness of best practice? And when there is such a bad apple in the group to really point your finger at them and show that this is not the direction you want the industry to go. Over, I'll take the ones in the room first. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks very much for that question. I think from from my end, um, this this topic of dredging, I think for a lot of financial institutions is um, tricky because they might not be aware that dredging is actually part of their, their project, as I mentioned earlier on. So, a lot of them, especially the bigger organizations, might not be aware that it's part of their value chain, and so would first have to do some work to, to, to realize where their raw material is coming from. And if that's been sourced uh, sustainably and responsibly, I think that that's probably step one. And we're trying via the, the working group that we have, the network that we have, we try to raise awareness about these issues in addition to a lot of other issues concerning the sustainable blue economy, but, but in, with this report specifically on, on dredging and marine aggregates extraction. So we're hoping that by um, you know, starting this work out. I mean, this has been published like two months ago, so it's relatively recent. It really, as a, see this as a start of, of a journey toward further further awareness raising among the financial community. I can't speak to the business, to the firms on the ground, and I'm, I'm sure Mark can do that. Um, but from a financial uh, institution point of view, I think there's awareness is probably the issue and then once you once you know and hopefully once we have these these standards that that Arno mentioned um this will all become a bit more transparent and, and i really hope that this will go a long way to towards addressing that but yes until then uh feel free to use the the recommendations that we give dredging in marine protected areas as i said is definitely a no-go that we highlight um so um uh, if you follow these you know, they stop short of a standard, of course, these recommendations. But if you follow these recommendations, at least this could, could be prevented. But over to you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Yeah, I, I think the point that you make about um, supply chain accountability is really, really important. Because at the end of the day, the, the dredging contractor is, is undertaking the work because they've been instructed to undertake the work by someone who is paying them. And 
more often than not, what you find is that sort of accountability gets lost in certain parts of the world because people don't think about it. And, and certainly the, the work that um, I've been involved in with UNET Grid, uh, which was published recently, focused on, on um, responsible sourcing and supply chain accountability for the very biggest projects as a, as a really good place to start because you have got national governments who are actually investing, who you would think have some interest in making sure things are done properly, uh, or indeed the global financial institutions. But unless they can make the link, unless they think about the potential consequences, they won't necessarily ask the right questions. And it's fair to say, even in the UK, um, the availability and supply of construction materials is, is largely assumed construct even even in a highly developed nation with a highly developed um, um, governance structure um, we have a major uh, development project taking place at the moment which is a, a, a rail line how high speed two and there's been no real thought around where the material to supply that particular project is coming from when actually what you need is far greater transparency around those material needs so you can ensure the most sustainable, but also the most cost-effective supply solutions can be provided. Thank you, Mark. I think you're really raising also here the issue of the story we're thinking that on geological scale, reserves are available, but on a human time frame, this story just doesn't add up anymore. Um, the story of ready, cheaply available sand is just not going to hold up anymore if we're moving forward uh, this way. I know they have a lot of questions coming in. I also want to give uh, the room a bit for the ones online. So I'm just going to take one question. There's been quite a few that came online, but one that is also relevant to all of us here is we were referring to some of the intergovernmental processes that were happening um, on the international stage, especially in the context of UNEA. And what, how that could support decision making. Is it we should be looking towards capacity building? Is it guidelines we need to develop? Um, is it a convention? What, what do we need to see happening from the government side um, in moving towards that um, and supporting um, any form of sustainable but also equitable extraction and use? And I know this is a $1, one million question, but I'm also looking uh, at Jean-Baptiste and from your perspective here, especially from the academia where you see the research is available. What, what would you like to see um, from the government side on that side? Thank you for that difficult question. I think it's a, it, it's a really hard one. Um, and the short answer is, I think we need all hands on deck. And so it, it, I alluded to that in my, in my final slide. I think it's, it's not just governments. Uh, it shouldn't be just the responsibility of voluntary commitments by the industry. Um, and it shouldn't be just financiers. Like financiers are going to ask how they can measure that. They're going to ask metrics and we go back to the need of data. So I think ultimately we need all those actors together to actually join forces. And I think what is fascinating in the context of the dredging industry and sand extraction more broadly is that you can compare it to other sectors, right? Uh, sand is a transboundary resource. Uh, you have an industrial highly consolidated side of it, but you also have a small scale, more local place extraction. Well, the seafood sector is also like that. And there are decades of work and decades of international agreement and decades of negotiation, some of them more successful than others, to actually move the needle on seafood sector in particular. So my point here is that there are a lot of lessons learned in, in other topics, in other extractive industries that really uh, could be useful to inform the development of, of sand extraction. For some reason, sand has been flying under the radar for way longer than uh, other resources. And I I'm always amazed at the lack of representation, for instance, of the large dredging companies in forum like the UN Ocean Conference or forum like the United Nations Global Compact that is one of the flagship bringing together industry player. And we're not hearing uh, much from the dredging companies. And I think this is a loss for the global community, but also for making progress because it's only through partnership and dialogue that we could actually um, move on on that. The, the learning is multi-directional, right? It's not scientists telling companies how to do things. Uh, there is learning from businesses to academics or civil society. 
and likewise between those different actors, certainly. I might just yeah very, very briefly add to that. I completely agree, Jean-Baptiste. I think collaboration is, is definitely key. But what really boggles my mind is that, as Mark said, you know, um, it's just assumed that the material is going to come from somewhere. So what I would say is we probably also need to challenge that view, that wrong view, I think, because, uh, you know, different construction and other sectors need to need to be aware and need to know where, where the sand is coming from for, for concrete and, and, and other projects. And uh, you can't just assume that it, it will it will just magically appear. So we need to make sure to, to challenge that and, and make that link back to sand extraction. Yeah, so completely agree with my colleagues and, 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 and Mark hits the nail on the head. Um, because there is no long term planning when it comes to construction and materials. Um, and for this, this is also an effort that needs to come from governments themselves, is, is, is when you create a project, think long term, think where the sand comes from, implement that in your tender process, include standards in your tender process for things to happen accordingly, do environmental impact assessments that make sense, that are done over years, because impacts of dredging do not happen overnight. Counting fish is not enough. Um, and I'll, I'll end up here, so I... <laughs> Thank you to all for your insight. I'm turning also to Leon online. Um, Leon, from your perspective in the Philippines, um, I'm sure you're here with me. What, what would you like to see either from, is it from the Filipino government or is it a higher scale to see the way we approach land reclamation projects and the way sand reserves are used in the Philippines? What, what, what needs to change on this side? Where should we be going towards? Right, so if, if I was to mention a single uh, point, and this is relevant not only to the Philippine government, not only to governments in general, but also to, to business as well, that um, in so it's not also only relevant to sands, no, but in environmentally critical projects in general. We, we think we really need to front load uh, science-based and rights-based impact assessments, really invest into these processes. And uh, again, uh, Right from the start, right from the onset, you know, we, we need to make it a requirement, whether through government uh, regulation or or again to vo voluntary guidelines or any other uh, any other uh, mechanisms as well. No, make it a requirement that before any permits and any development activities are allowed, they have to conduct uh, an honest to goodness uh, due diligence on on the possible impacts, socioeconomic and ecological as well from sand extraction and from dredging and reclamation. So just to give for, for an example, uh, I know our, our five minute sharing, my five minute sharing earlier was, you know, sounds rosy, but actually uh, the process fell on deaf ears no, to national government, but also to the proponent of the Aero City here in the Philippines, which is supposedly uh, being implemented by a Dutch dredger that supposedly subscribes to global standards and also was supposedly conducted uh, human rights and environmental due diligence, but they all failed at the onset of the project by uh, really not engaging with the communities. So even before any any uh, environmental compliance uh, or certificates or permits were issued, there were already hundreds of mangroves cut. There were already hundreds of families displaced in the area. So. Right at the onset, if you fail, the failure will cascade further down the, the process of the dredging and reclamation activity. So really, at the onset, we have to do an honest to goodness, uh, rights-based, science-based uh, impact assessment. Thank you so much, Leon. Really emphasizing the importance of public consultations of, as Dennis also mentioned in your report, the importance here of bringing in the communities and assessing these impacts ahead of any project. Um, I'm handing it over to Humai, um, and you, and the, you have the last words before we close up today's panel. Oh, thank you. If I may just very quickly share my screen to show you an image, because we are talking about uh, uh, because we are talking about uh, financing institutions. Now, 
the the Gulifa report development project uh, is going to use 120 million dollars uh, uh, you know, to do the dredging work. It actually uses three times more sand than is needed if it was being done elsewhere. So, you know, the deep lagoon filling is going to take a lot of filling, I guess. So um, the, the, the proposal that financing uh, institutions are, um, are, are cognizant of the uh, actual damage that will be done uh, at the location is really necessary. However, what we find is that uh, for the Gulifalu uh, uh, project, uh, Maldives uh, government has signed uh, 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 an agreement with three European banks. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, one is the ABN AMRO Bank, uh, the AKA, uh, I think it's the European Trade Bank and, uh, and uh, the ING Bank. Now these ING Bank it has been a lender for dredging uh, for the last uh, God knows how long, as far as I can uh, get information. So, uh, and, and Netherlands companies, Leon mentioned uh, the Dutch dredging companies. They are very active here, uh, you know, Buscalis of Netherlands, and, uh, and, and they are dredging the Gulifalu project. Um, we have actually tried to find due diligence, uh, uh, you know, uh, in these activities and, and, and tried to connect with uh, institutions through uh, supportive NGOs uh, uh, in, in Netherlands. And, and we have tried to make those connections, but this is impossible. The, the, the infrastructure, uh, these, these uh, uh, bureaucratic infrastructure is absolutely impossible for activists on the ground in the Maldives to navigate, you know. So uh, uh, the fact that uh, that this this is happening with the agree with this with the uh, in engagement of the the, the government and uh, these global financiers uh, is actually very very difficult. Uh, personally, I am taking legal action against the government on the Gulifalu port development project. It is actually in court right now. It is ongoing. Um, but this is impossible to do for all these activities, you know. So um, I am not, I think uh, the, the, the good practice, uh, you know, due diligence is really necessary by the financial institutions because, because they are part of the problem, uh, as I see it. I will uh, stop sharing screen, uh, but this is this is a problem. You know, even Addu case, uh, uh, the biosphere reserve dredging, is going to be supported by the Exim Bank of India. Uh, these are this is government to government activities. It is impossible for activists to resist this sort of thing, but we try. Um, uh, you know, the 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 climate crisis is upon us, and and. Uh, the, the fact that uh, financial institutions and, and governments are uh, not responding to this is, is extremely problematic. And, and I think uh, this is a, a dialogue that really needs to be taken uh, at, at whatever level is necessary. But we, in, from our little ways, we try to, uh, to be seen and be heard in various places for these issues to be uh, addressed uh, by those who, who can. Uh, but thank you for this opportunity once again. I just wanted to share the, the barriers that we have, uh, you know, uh, with global financiers, especially when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, thank, thank you, you once again. Thank you, Humay. I think... And on this note, um, I think this is an excellent note to also conclude our panel um, for today and on a note of not only urgency, but put solutions out there. There are ideas for how we can think about in moving towards responsible sand extraction and use. And you've heard from very different examples today from different communities, both online. I know the chat is very active. Um, so hope do get in touch after this um, with us. On this note, we will end today's panel. And thank you so much for joining us today. You can follow us. The contact details uh, will be sent out to you, only both to on-site and to online participants. After that, with more material from today's event. And uh, thank you. And apologies for the delay. <laughs>